Hi, I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wingate University. John Hibbing is Foundations Regent University Professor of Political Science at the University of Lincoln, Nebraska. A native of Iowa, Dr. Hibbing took degrees from Dana College and the University of Iowa. A widely respected scholar in American and congressional politics, Hibbing is cited widely and was featured on John Stewart's The Daily Show for his interdisciplinary work on biological predisposition to politics, work that he'll talk about today. He has been a research fellow at Sidansk University in Denmark and a distinguished visiting fellow at the Sage Center for the Study of the Mind. His accomplishments in the field of political science would take days to discuss, and I promise most of you that we'd only be here an hour. So I'd like to take a brief moment before we begin and read something he wrote about a man named Richard Finno, another political scientist, a very distinguished one at that, who also did very cutting edge work. And so the book I'm going to read from is a book called Homestyle. And my first introduction to John Hibbing was he wrote the, the foreword for this book. And um, some of these words aren't going to make sense if you're not in political science. But he says something in here that I think is really meaningful to me as a political scientist who was interested at the time in doing things that people weren't doing. And obviously, Dr. Hibbing's work is really cutting edge stuff that uh, people would say, well, you can't do that. And, and, he, and he certainly did. So here's what he said about Richard Finno uh, and his book, Homestyle, a book which was groundbreaking in its publication. Let me be clear, I believe in the scientific approach to studying the social world, and in this sense, I would not want all social scientists to adopt Richard Finno's techniques for open-ended participant observation, and neither would Finno. We would lose much if this were done, but we also lose much when we abide by disciplinary norms that discourage scholars from sticking a toe in the water of qualitative participant observation of the Finno variety. At least, at the least, this type of research is a rich source of insights and hypotheses that can then be tested in more traditional scientific fashion. This is precisely what Finno has in mind when he repeatedly refers to his work as exploratory. Alas, junior scholars, that's folks like me and Dr. Krajewska, are not, much, uh, are not much rewarded for deriving hypotheses, but rather for testing them. Perhaps this is as it should be. But if it is, then we need to encourage senior scholars, folks like Dr. Hibbing, those with established reputations, or at least tenure, to follow in Finno's footsteps. Exploration generally is followed by colonization, or at least by more explorers. And so from that, I want to introduce you to John Hibbing, who does wonderful, cutting edge research in political science, has made a wonderful, wonderful contribution to our discipline. John Hibbing. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about where political attitudes come from. In fact, let me begin by maybe reframing this a little bit and, and asking you to think where your political attitudes did come from. What, uh, what do you think generated the views that you have? I think most of you would probably put parents in the mix somewhere that we're, we're socialized to uh, believe certain things. Uh, peers would be another possibility, you, uh, a certain trusted individual that you discussed politics with that was influential to you. Maybe uh, a year or two ago, you moved in with a wild roommate, and uh, that uh, altered your political views. Uh, maybe there's a salient event. A lot of you were quite, quite young when 9-11 took place, but it could be something else, something that just you remember reading about in the newspaper that was kind of searing for you. A uh, respected person coming out, you know, it could be a social kind of thing, on Michael Sam. Uh, a friend being deployed positive story about Obamacare or a negative story about Obamacare. Uh, you know, it's, 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 these are the kinds of events that are all around us and presumably have led us to have some of the views that we have. Well, um, in truth, I think that, that even though these are the kinds of things we imagine as being influential in our political beliefs, uh, we have to be a little careful here. Um, they may not always be uh, as influential as we think. So here's where you know, this guy blows into town and says, you're wrong about where you, you, got, you, you think you get, received your political beliefs, uh, but just hear me out, be patient, and, and uh, you don't have to agree with me, but, but at least consider the possibilities that some of the things we believe with regard to politics have not come from the sources we think they've come from. I say this partly because humans are really bad at figuring out why they do the things they do. We're in, so there's no reflection on us in this room. This is just a general thing. We think we know, but a lot of times we don't. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we imagine to be influential, such as parents, turn out upon closer inspection to not be all that influential. So here's a picture of Dick Cheney and his two daughters who have very different political views. 
Um, the one daughter was running for the United States Senate in Wyoming as a very right-wing candidate until she dropped out. The other daughter is a lesbian who has uh, views that would best be classified as on the political left, both daughters of, of, of uh, Dick Cheney, former vice president. So that's an anecdote. More generally, though, if you look at the data, um, there's been some very good research done by a guy's named uh, Nimi and, and Jennings, who had a nice data set of the views of parents and the views of 18-year-olds, people not that different in age from you. And if parents are influential, they should be pretty high correlations. But as you can see here, these correlations are really quite low. So what they mean, they're positive. So that means if a parent is a pro-labor parent, the child is more likely to be pro-labor than pro-business, uh, but not by much. That's pretty close to zero. School prayer, more of a hot button issue, a little bit higher, um, but still not that great. Political interest, those parents who are really interested in politics probably have kids who are a little bit interested in politics, but that correlation, again, is, is really quite low. Um, so some of the things we think are influential are not. Some of the things we don't think to be influential really are. And here I'm, I'm broadening out a little bit away from politics. Uh, but there are some, some studies that have been done that suggest that there are a lot of things that influence us, even though we don't think they're very important. Here's uh, the study I'm illustrating with this particular slide. If you put an orange down in front of somebody and ask them to reach out and grab the orange, they will. If you fill the air of the room in which that act is taking place with the smell of strawberries, they'll actually spread their fingers less widely as they reach out to the orange. Now, obviously, when they get to the orange, they'll, they'll spread them wide enough to get it. But um, you know, they don't think that influences them, but it does. And you can do the same thing in reverse, um, have the room smell like uh, an orange, and uh, people are supposed to pick up a strawberry, and they'll spread their fingers too widely. You can videotape this and watch it. So um, if you ask them, were your actions influenced by that smell, they, people tend to say no. Some of you may have heard about this, where uh, in an experimental setting, they'll have people evaluate somebody's resume, and sometimes they'll put their resume on a very heavy clipboard, and sometimes they'll put it on something that's much lighter. It turns out that the evaluations are more favorable when they're on a heavy clipboard. And somehow, it, it, psychologically, it's like this person must have gravitas, and must have some weight because this clipboard is heavy. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And if you ask people, was the weight of the clipboard important to you as you evaluated that person's resume, that resume, they'll say no. But the data show that it is important. If you have people make moral judgments, you know, they'll tell them, tell them stories about what somebody did and say, was that a, the appropriate thing to do from a moral point of view? They're much more likely to issue harsh moral judgments if they're placed in a room that's messy and, the, and especially smelly than if they're placed in a nice, clean room. Here again, you ask them, was your setting important to you? And they say, no, this is a moral judgment. Why would the setting be important? Well, yeah, it is. In the United States, we vote in lots of different settings. Some people vote in schools. Some people vote in churches. Some people vote in community buildings. It turns out, several studies have demonstrated that those people who vote in churches, controlling for everything else, are more likely to vote in a more conservative fashion than those people who vote in public schools. People will say, that doesn't matter to me, but it does. Uh, is global warming taking place? People are much more likely to say that it is if they're in uh, a hot room. Even if you tell them the air conditioner is broken, you, know, you can say that this has nothing to do with you know, the earth warming up, You're in, you know, the air conditioner is broken. People are still much more likely to say global warming is a reality um, if they're in that, in, in that room. Here's one that I kind of like that is at the same time a little bit scary. We like to think that judges aren't influenced by anything except the, the facts of the case. But it turns out that they're heavily influenced by how long it's been since they've had a break. So uh, if you're before a judge, you want to be there right after they've had a break. Here's the data that demonstrate this. So early on, I guess I will try the pointer. Uh, at the start of the day, uh, the higher it is here, that's the proportion of favorable decisions to the defendant. So if you're the defendant, this is a good thing for you. The judge is fresh um, and issues some fairly generous decisions to you. But look what happens by the time you take the first break. Uh, basically, all the decisions are not going the way of the defendant. Have a nice break, then we're back up here, goes down again, same thing. So, uh, same story. If you ask the judge, uh, was the length of time since your break influence, uh, influencing your decision, they would be very huffy, I imagine, and say, of course not. But that's simply not the case. The point is there are lots of things that, uh, that influence us we don't think influence us. Now, it gets even worse. So I mean, those things at least 
people did know that, that they existed. They knew there was a smell of strawberries. They knew they hadn't had a break for a while. They just didn't think those factors affected their actions and decisions. Some of the things can happen that we don't even know about. Uh, here's a study that was done at uh, uh, some scholars at Stony Brook. And what they did was to show a picture of a cheesy, yellow, smiley face uh, for 39 milliseconds, and that's really fast. It's much too quick for the mind to register consciously that it has seen anything. So the, some people would call this subliminal. So it's a sub-threshold sub thing. They showed some people a smiley face and then asked them for their opinions. Uh, they had to write actually a series of justifications for uh, immigration. And it turned out they were more likely to write a lot of things that were favorable toward immigration, especially compared to people who had been subliminally exposed to a frowny face then they would say things like, uh, they'd be more likely to say things that were negative against immigration. Uh, again, stop and think about what's going on here. In this case, it's not just something's there that people are aware of but they think is irrelevant. This is something that they're not even aware of and it's still affecting their decisions. They give statistically different answers about immigration just depending on whether they were primed with that, with that silly little yellow smiley face. So the thing is, humans really want to tell a story. And so when I ask you to think about why you have the political views you do, you've got this kind of narrative in your head. You know, your mom or your dad was influential. Several things happened in your lives. And we really believe these narratives. But a lot of times, they're simply not accurate. A study I really like was one where they had these ge geometric shapes put on a computer screen, uh, a square, a triangle, a circle. And then they programmed the geometric shapes to move in random directions. So they were just bouncing around, that's all they did. But then they ask human beings what happened to, to describe what they just saw. And they'll always personify this, uh, anthropomorphize it. So they'll say, well, the, the circle was scared of the triangle. So it went up in the corner and hid. And then this came. And so they're always telling this story. This is what I mean by a narrative. Uh, and it's simply not true. Those things were uh, entirely random. Uh, there's only one group of the population that does not do that. You might guess who it is, it's autistic individuals who we think of being mentally challenged, but in this case, who really is mentally challenged? I mean, they're calling it like it is. They're, they're saying there was, you know, nothing happened. They give a matter of fact description of how those geometric shapes moved. So-called neurotypicals are the ones who read way too much into this. Steven Pinker is a famous psychologist, and you may, may be familiar with his work, and he's fond of the term the baloney generator, and he uses that term to refer to what I'm talking about, that we we tell these stories that, that make sense to us, but they uh, unfortunately are a lot of times baloney. So um, I just wanted to make sure you realize that we can be very convinced that we know why we do the things we do, but a lot of times it's, it's not true. So I hope you're at least open-minded to some alternative possibilities, and that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of my talk. Um, so growing evidence suggests the political preferences are influenced by forces deep inside us that we uh, either do not believe to be relevant or of which we are unaware. These forces are psychological, cognitive, physiological, neurological, and perhaps even genetic. So, you know, a lot of people will say, well, conservatives must be conservative because they watch a lot of Fox News. I think the real question is um, why they watch Fox News in the first place and why some other people watch MSNBC. Um, these shows can be influential, but people are attracted to them. I know some people who wouldn't watch Fox News uh, for all the tea in China. This is just not something they're, they're comfortable doing. So I'd like to understand those initial predispositions rather than the things that happen later. People, unfortunately, are not rational processors of information, but rather are shaped by sub-threshold predispositions. Um, the book that uh, describes the Stony, Stony Brook studies talks about the rationalizing voter rather than the rational voter, meaning we, we do things and then rationalize them later. We come up with an explanation for what we did. Uh, no matter where and when we live, we all have biases, and these biases spring from forces that extend well beyond the political world. Um, and so I think we don't quite understand human nature, and we don't understand politics fully. At least that's another uh, bold statement I want to make. And uh, you know, we were talking just a minute ago about this neat global studies program you have. I uh, have to take that class, and it sounds like you're exposed to lots of different countries and the politics and variations. And that's important to do, but I also think if you look closely, you'll see some commonalities in the politics of countries throughout the world. And I call these bedrock principles of politics. It, it looks really different, and the issues here are different than they are in, uh, in Poland or than they were in the United States 50 years ago. But a lot of times you can see some, some similarities. And what I'm thinking of in terms of these bedrock principles, things like protecting uh, us from outgroups, I mean, that's a, a, we all need to wrestle with that. If, whether it's a hunter-gatherer society or a modern, developed Western democracy of, of a billion people, 
you need to figure out what exactly you're going to have in terms of a relationship with so-called outgroups, uh, you know, people who are not in, in your country. Are we going to spend a lot on defense or not? What are we going to do about in-group norm violators, people who commit crimes? Are we going to work on rehabilitation or are we going to work on retribution? Uh, uh, three strikes, you're out, capital punishment, all these things need to be decided. What kind of leadership structure are we going to have? One person at the top in an authoritarian kind of system or a more uh, consultating kind of system? How are we going to distribute resources? This takes the form of discussions about the tax codes and things like that, but back in hunter-gatherer times, we still had to figure out how to divide the spoils of the hunt. And maybe more generally, just uh, this notion of, of whether we're going to have a society that really is devoted to tradition and the way we've done things in the past, or one that's a little bit more oriented toward try, trying new things. It's this last bedrock principle that uh, is picked up nicely in one of my favorite writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson. We think of him not really as a political commentator, but uh, we should because he's, he's uh, very uh, incisive, insightful. Um, he said, the two parties which divide the state, the party of conservatism and that of innovation, are very old and have disputed the possession of the world ever since it was made. Um, and in a similar vein, John Stuart Mill says, it is a commonplace for political systems to have a party of order or stability and a party of progress and reform. So here's this orientation to new things or old things. And we see that, that that's something that has to be worked through any place at any time. And in this vein, now, you know, we, we talk about different names. We refer to liberals and conservatives today, with conservatives being a little bit more oriented toward tradition and liberals being more oriented toward doing things in a new way. But uh, we can see these divisions applying throughout uh, history, really. Sparta and Athens. Sparta had a kind of conservative, militaristic approach. Athens was uh, the place where new ideas were bouncing around. Those of you who know your Roman history, the Optimates and Populares were, were uh, parallel groups in some respects, roundheads and cavaliers. Inquisition and Enlightenment, you know, this is an easy game to play. It doesn't take much to, to jot these down. If you move to the individual level, protagonist was the conservative, as Plato was to liberal. Pope Urban VIII had a little bit of a different orientation toward new ideas than uh, Galileo did. Marie Le Pen is a, a darling of the political right in France uh, right now, and Francois Hollande is the uh, president of France, the socialist. Sarah Palin, Hillary Clinton, and conservatives and liberals. So, I'm emphasizing this because a lot of my political science colleagues have trouble with this concept, and I understand why. You know, they get so um, you know, immersed in the knowledge of their own country that they see all the, the distinctions and the nuances. And I'm saying don't forget about those, but, but do recognize that there are some similarities. This conservative and liberal or left-right orientation has just been amazingly stubborn throughout history. So it seems to me there's probably something there that does, does orient, it, uh, uh, orient the divisions that way. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, how we can, can look at these deep bases. Where, what puts us either on the left or the right of the political spectrum? Uh, and I think it's more than politics. It's not just what you've heard from your mom or your dad. And a lot of these things are, are not overtly political. So we're going to talk about tastes, cognitive patterns, physiological patterns, neurological patterns, uh, and genetics. And some of these will go pretty fast, so don't, don't be too intimidated by, uh, by the five categories. So let's think about tastes first. Uh, some colleagues and I had, uh, we did a, a random uh, survey, a fairly large one, and we had these four questions included in it. Should poetry rhyme? Should novels end with a clear resolution? Or is it okay when, if they're kind of ambiguous as they end? If you had a choice between uh, a new and exciting dish or your favorite meal, which would you pick? And finally, should art be realistic? So uh, we got answers to those questions, and we also found out people's political beliefs, and we found out that there was a correlation for all those things and uh, political beliefs. Conservatives are more likely than liberals to say that the poetry should rhyme, uh, and uh, that novels should end with a clear resolution. The conservatives are more likely to say, I'd like to have my favorite dish as opposed to something new and exciting. And conservatives are more likely to say that art should be realistic. Now, note that these correlations are pretty low. They're significant, and they're, these things happen in lots of different countries. I just saw a study about art preferences in India, and it was exactly the same. Conservatives in India are more likely to, to like uh, simplistic and realistic art. Um, so the, but if you're out there and saying, whoa, I'm a liberal, but I really hate experimental verse, don't worry. You know, you got lots of company. There's lots of exceptions to the rule here. But it is a, a, a very stubborn pattern that indicates that conservatives are a little bit more comfortable with the way things tend to be done traditionally, as opposed to something that more avant-garde. 
You don't just have to do this with surveys. You can do it with people's life, what, what's the word they use? Uh, life space, the things that they have in their life space. This was an interesting study done where they would go into people's rooms. Some of these were dorm rooms. Some of them were uh, apartment bedrooms. Uh, they do this with permission. Uh, some of them were offices. And then they'd record what was there. They had this protocol that they'd follow. And then later on, they found out the political persuasions of the people who owned those bedrooms or offices. And so a positive correlation here means that these particular things were more likely to be found in the rooms of conservatives. A uh, negative number means that they're more likely to be found in the rooms of, uh, of liberals. So in other words, it looks like conservatives are more likely to have a, a sports uh, uh, poster, let's say, uh, event calendars, postage stamps, sewing thread, ironing boards, laundry baskets, uh, to have a, a kind of well-lighted and perhaps even a, a neat as opposed to a messy room. So these are sometimes viewed as organizing principles. You know, you're, you're taking care of your clothes. Uh, whereas liberals, uh, the negative numbers, we see they're more likely to have lots of books, a variety of books, have art supplies, have CDs, movie tickets, more experiential kinds of things. So some of these are kind of stereotypes that we have, but uh, the thing I like about this study uh, is that it suggests that there is some truth to that, that we can tell something about the political views of an individual just from looking at, at their life spaces. Uh, so that's a couple of examples of research done on tastes. I also mentioned cognitive procedures. So this is just how we think, what we pay attention to. And it looks like that's different as well between people on the left and people on the right. And perhaps I should pause here just a second. You maybe wonder what we mean by that. Uh, some people, some researchers will just ask individuals, do you place yourself on the left or the right politically, a liberal or a conservative? I really prefer asking them about specific issues. So we can say, well, you know, what's your attitude toward school prayer, toward gay marriage? Uh, toward redistributive taxes, things like that, so we can get more of a substantive basis for, for what they are. So this is what, when I say people on the left or people on the right, liberals or conservatives, it has to do with their, their positions on these sets of issues. All right, so here's one you can kind of play along. This is a, a gaze cueing task that psychologists use fairly frequently. Your job, imagine that you're sitting in front of a computer and you're supposed to hit the space bar as soon as you see a, a kind of big black dot on the computer screen. But before that black dot comes up, first you see this cartoonish face, then you see a cartoonish face with eyes in it, and then the dot appears, boom, you hit the space bar, okay? So that was pretty easy. Sometimes, though, it goes like this, the dot appears over there, and boom, you hit the space bar. Well, you do this a lot of times. Sometimes the eyes look right, sometimes left, sometimes the dot appears over there, sometimes over here. Uh, what psychologists know, though, is that there is a gaze cueing effect, and you are quicker to hit the space bar when the dot appears where those eyes are looking. So we, you know, our eyes just kind of drift over there. This has long been known, but we wondered if it was equally true for people on the left and people on the right. Uh, and so we divided it out that way, and it turns out that liberals are much more susceptible. So this is the difference between whether the dot appeared where the eyes were looking or, was, or not looking. And there's a big difference for liberals, and really that's not even significantly different than zero for conservatives. Now, you're probably all wondering, you know, is this guy saying something bad about conservatives or bad about liberals? Uh, I'm, I'm really trying not to, because I, I don't know which way is best to be in this case. And it turns out, we, we did a survey once where we asked people, we kind of described this experiment, and we said, which way is it better to be? And sure enough, conservatives said it's better to uh, not have this gaze cueing effect, because maybe I skipped over this too quickly. One of the things that happens, the, the direction of those eyes does not give you any information about where the dot's going to appear. That's random. And people are told that at the beginning. So you, know, you, you should kind of ignore the eyes. And conservatives are better at doing that. It's, perhaps it's because conservatives are better at following instructions, and they tend to be. So there is very little gaze cueing effect, and conservatives think that's the way it should be. You know, would you, know, you play in the street just because your best friend was? You know, you're supposed to be your own person. Liberals are more likely to say, well, of course you should follow the gaze of those other eyes. That's part of being a human. That's just part of the human condition, is that we're in touch with the people around us, even in this case, a cartoon. So the point is, not, I'm not disparaging one side or the other. I'm just saying these are very important differences that exist between people on the left and people on the right. And I think it's, uh, I think it's kind of reflective of, of the views that they have on politics. Here's one you might like. Uh, hard categorizers or soft categorizers. So your task here is to decide whether this animal is a zoo animal or a farm animal? Well, that's a pretty childish thing. I think we all could handle that. Zebras are mostly zoo animals. Uh, this cute little pig is probably a farm animal. So far, so good. 
and you put up something like that, and things get a little trickier. You know, I'm from Nebraska, and I, I've got a neighbor who has bison, uh, but I've also seen him in a zoo, so what am I going to do here? Well, it turns out, if I'm a liberal, I probably ask if I could put it in the middle, or I say, could I do both? And they've set this experiment up a lot of different ways. Sometimes you can make a special, uh, you could drag the bison to the middle question mark category, but it's just not a labeled category, so it's clearly not designed that way. Conservatives are more likely to be hard categorizers. They'll put it in either the zoo or the farm. Liberals are the ones who tend to equivocate or ask for some special dispensation. Uh, again, uh, not that one side is better than the other. These are just differences in the way we cognitively approach these tasks. Conservatives are more likely to be hard categorizers. You're going to see some nasty pictures in the next little bit. So if you're, uh, if you're squeamish, you can always look away. So the, uh, this one, I don't know if you can tell very well, um, but there's this kind of, kind of food on the left with some bugs on it. And then we got a cute little bunny rabbit. So this is a split screen, and what happens in this test, which is a dot probe test, is that after you look at this for a little bit, then a dot's going to appear, and kind of the same as the other one, you're supposed to hit the space bar when you hear the dot. Well, they have a whole bunch of these split screen shots, and sometimes the dot appears uh, on the left, sometimes on the right, sometimes on the pleasant picture, sometimes on the unpleasant picture, and they're always paired like that. There's one nice one and one, one not so nice one. So it, eventually the dot will appear on the spoiled, or the rotten food, and then another time it'll appear uh, on the bunny. And it turns out people are quicker to hit the space bar when the dot appears on the negative image. This is called the negativity bias, and something you'll hear a lot in the next couple of minutes from me. Uh, we seem, as human beings, to be a little bit more keyed into the negative. So the fact that I was quicker to hit the space bar when the dot appeared on the negative food probably means my attention was kind of drawn over that direction anyway, and that's why I was faster. So uh, we just seem to be a little bit more oriented toward that. What's interesting is, if you break it down by types of, of political views, conservatives have a greater negativity bias. So it really matters to them. The conservatives are very fast to hit the space bar when the dot appears on the, the bad image, like this bad food. Um, another by the way, that was done in Italy. So uh, a lot of this stuff has been done in the US, but I think it's important to point out that, that this is a, a broader kind of thing that's going on. This was also done in Italy. Uh, you've probably heard of the Stroop test, where your mission as a research participant is to report the font color that the word is written in. So in other words, you're supposed to say, you see ball, and you say, that's red. Pig is blue, gate is blue, uh, paper is red, building is red, red is blue. See, that's where it gets tricky, right? And that's the famous part of the Stroop test, that you're reading red, but your task is to say that what color is that written in. You have to say it's, it's blue. All right, uh, well, that's not what interests us. Another way to do this, a, a variant of the Stroop test, is so-called emotional Stroop. And that's where you just have some words that are positive, like positive, or sorry, party, comedian, sunrise, happy, and beautiful. And then you have some that are negative, criminal, danger, infection, disaster, and death. And again, your task is to write, or to report which color those words are written in. Well, it turns out that people are a little bit uh, slower to report font color when it's a negative word, probably because their cognitive energy is taken up looking at the word. You know, I'm just so fixated on things like criminal and danger and infection that I slow down just a little bit. Well, you can probably guess what's coming. Even though that's a general trend, if you break it down by political beliefs, conservatives slow down a lot more than liberals. So it seems like they're focused more. Their attention is directed toward the negative thing. There's a simpler way to get all this. If we want to know where people are directing their attention, you can actually put a, a little gadget on them. It's called an eye tracker. And then you can show them a series of images like these. We call this a collage. And I, told, I warned you about the images, right? So um, there's a nice organization that has looked at a bunch of these pictures and they pre-rate them. So a lot of people have looked at these images and they've decided whether they are favorable or unfavorable. We probably didn't need that information here because I think we can figure it out. This one has three favorable images. Most people like giraffes, angels, and cookies. Most people aren't that keen on, on this poor guy in the lower right. Um, so uh, what we're interested in doing is um, looking at, through, with, using the eye tracker to see what people are focused on in this collage of images. Do their eyes rest on the chocolate chip cookie, or are they fixated on the guy um, who's losing his cookies? Uh, here's another example. This one has three negative and one positive. The beach ball is generally rated as, as favorable, and uh, the other ones are negative. Here are the results. So psychologists know that most, this doesn't surprise anybody, that most people spend a little more time looking at the negative images. 
our contribution is when we broke it down by political views, we see that conservatives spend a lot more time looking at the negative. So this is the negativity bias for liberals, about uh, four-tenths of a second. Um, and, but if you look at conservatives, their uh, negativity bias was almost uh, 1.6 seconds. Now, at first, that didn't sound like much to me, 1.2 seconds difference. Uh, but the eye tracker specialist we showed this to said this was like an eternity in an eight-second free view, so that made us, made us feel good. Uh, conservatives are more likely to pay attention to negative things is really what it comes down to. Shifting from the cognitive to the physiological, uh, this is where we're not interested in how quickly people hit a space bar or where their eyes are directed. We're interested in their, their actual uh, autonomic nervous system, in this case, a sympathetic nervous system. Are there differences between liberals and conservatives in what people respond to physiologically? The most popular way of measuring uh, sympathetic nervous system activity is electrodermal, or some people call it skin conductance, which has kind of a bad name because people think of lie detector tests. And it, it turns out this technique is not very reliable to figure out who's lying and who's telling the truth. But it is uh, universally accepted as a good way of finding out if people are aroused uh, in an emotional way uh, or not. And it's pretty simple. Uh, as you can see here, you put a couple of sensors on people's fingers. Actually, you put a little, a little collar, if you can see the white stuff up there. Uh, you put that on first, and then a little bit of a gel, and wrap it with that kind of uh, Velcro strip thing. And it's just going to pump a little bit of electricity across the fingers. And we all know that if, the, if a surface is moist, there's less resistance and the electricity will move more rapidly. So this is basically detecting whether or not your eccrine glands have released any, um, any sweat, uh, is what it amounts to. And it's sensitive enough, your palms don't need to get sweaty. Uh, there can be a change even though it feels perfectly dry to you because these are pretty sensitive instruments. The nice thing about electrodermal activity is we know, you know if, if you're aroused, if, whether it be positively or negatively, maybe you see a loved one and you want to go up and give them a hug, or maybe you see a bear and you want to run away, uh, the, the sympathetic nervous system is going to kick into gear. Presumably the sweat glands open because we don't want to overheat. Um, so, and for some reasons besides that that I don't need to get into right now, this is, this is a measure that people tend to use. It's, it's easy to use and it's accurate. So what we do here, instead of showing them a combination of pictures, we're showing them one at a time because we want to see what, what gives them a physiological reaction. Some of these pictures are positive. Uh, this one, by the way, in, in this whole set of images I mentioned to you was, I think, the top one. People seem to really find this a favorable, positive image, uh, somebody having a good time uh, in an adventurous kind of setting. Uh, attractive foodstuffs are another thing that usually get very positive ratings. Uh, here's a, one that got a very negative rating. Uh, and here's one I'm particularly proud of. I don't know if you can see who that guy is, but that, that I'm the one who's eating the worms in this case. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and the reason I did that, and just a quick backstory, I told you that these were a series of slides that are provided by a service, and they are, but we had, when we published some research on this, a lot of the media outlets wanted an example of the images that we used, and we couldn't because the, the academic service that provides the images says they can't be for any media purposes, they're just for research purposes. So we had to simulate this. I asked a couple of my graduate students to do it, a couple of my co-authors to do it, and none of them would. So um, I had to step up to the plate and have a nice mouthful of worms, and you, you all should try them sometime. Anyway, another example of a, a negative image. All right, so the blue line is uh, liberals, the dotted red line is conservatives. Psychologists sometimes use the phrase aversive to mean negative and appetitive to mean positive. So what this shows is that really liberals are not having a greater physiological reaction to the negative image or aversive image than the positive. That, that blue line is basically flat. But then contrast that with conservatives. There we see conservatives have a much larger physiological reaction to negative images. Things like a guy eating worms, a spider on a face, people fighting uh, was another one. Uh, uh, then they do to appetitive images. Things like uh, a person skiing, a happy kid, uh, a cute bunny, et cetera, a bowl of fruit. So there does seem to be a greater negativity bias in a cognitive sense and also in a physiological sense for conservatives than for, than for liberals. Here's another way to think about it. We showed them 35 pictures, I think, total. And we just decided maybe it would be useful to, to just list the top pictures in terms of what generated a physiological reaction for those on the left, so for liberals or those on the right, conservatives. So you can see that it's a pretty different list. The happy kid. Uh, was a, a big increase in physiology for people on the left, as was a biracial kiss. It was like a, a pair of black lips and a pair of white lips. 
A fruit bowl, those things really boosted things for, for the left of center. On the right, the largest physiological reaction was the one you saw, the spider on the face. Then we also had one of a, a fist fight and of uh, people arguing. So that's just a very different concept of what, what kinds of images, or a very different list of the images that seem to inspire a physiological reaction. What's well, always nice to work into a talk, a picture of a good-looking guy like uh, Colin Firth, but you might wonder how he fits. It's kind of interesting. Firth is a, a well-known liberal. He's proud of it. And uh, he said, you know, I want to figure out what's up with conservatives. I want to figure out what's going on with them. How can they view the world so differently than I do? So he put up money to do this neuroimaging research. They had about 100 uh, people in London that participated in the study. That's a very large number for a neuroimaging study because they're, they're complicated to do. Uh, so he's actually co-author on this article that appeared in Current Biology, which is a very well-known uh, journal in biology, which I don't think many A-list movie actors probably are. Uh, so what they did was, th this wasn't a functional magnetic resonance imaging study, and that functional means people are doing something while they're in the brain scanner. Here it's just MRI. They're just looking at the, the uh, structure of the brain, and they found the, the lower one is really the most important one probably, that uh, a portion of the brain known as the amygdala, which you've probably heard of, it's heavily involved with a fear and emotional processing, and it looks like there's more gray matter for conservatives, so this runs from liberal to conservative as you move left to right, so you see the line coming up. So there's more gray matter volume in the right amygdala uh, for conservatives than for liberals. The anterior cingulate's another part of the brain. Uh, and there we see a different pattern. It's actually going the opposite direction uh, where uh, liberals have more gray matter volume there. So it's, it's an interesting idea though. We don't need to get into the neuroscience too much, but the idea that there could be these structural differences that have some influence on our political beliefs, I think is not something that we would have thought of way back when, at the beginning of a, tonight's talk, when I said, why do you have the political beliefs that you do? Here's a, one or other neuroimaging study I want to mention, because this is one we did on our own, and we're not quite done with it yet, but we showed, kind of back to our favorite motif here, we showed people pictures that are disgusting, that are threatening, that are neutral, or that are positive. Now, you've seen most of those. Uh, neutral images, by the way, would be things like a pencil or a toaster, things that just don't really inspire much feeling one way or the other. So we compared people's uh, brain response to when they were looking at disgusting images as opposed to neutral images. And this doesn't come off very well, but the amygdala is one of the, the areas that is more active, and the insula is another one that's part of the brain involved with, with disgust, especially when the threatening images are shown. Uh, then we do see greater activation in the amygdala. So that's, that's all as should be. But then when we compare the brain activation patterns of liberals and conservatives, we found something that I think is even more interesting. Those particular brain regions don't differentiate. So all, both conservatives and liberals are having amygdala reactions and insular reactions. But what's interesting is uh, this column over here shows where conservatives have more activation than liberals. And they have it in part of the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is oftentimes involved in kind of tamping down emotions. So the, the amygdala is giving them this reaction. They're seeing something disgusting. They feel disgusted or threatened. Uh, but this MPFC, the medial prefrontal cortex, is kind of saying, well, let's, let's maybe not take that too seriously. Uh, or maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable feeling that way. It's kind of the opposite with liberals. This is the part of the brain. Um, so again, this is, means liberals. Uh, have greater reactions in these part of the brains than conservatives. The S2 is called the somatosensory 2, and that's where we feel pain. So if I you know, kicked Joseph in the shin really hard right now, his S2 would go off. But also, uh, a lot of you seeing that would have an S2 reaction. So we can, this is part of the empathy part of the brain as well. In fact, I always think of Bill Clinton's famous line, you know, he loved to say, I feel your pain. So this suggests that liberals probably are a little bit better at that. They're having a greater S2, somatosensory 2 reaction, than, uh, than conservatives. And this was especially true, what, what I think drives us home, when we showed images that were involved with um, mutilation. There are a couple of ways of showing disgust. Uh, one is just like uh, you know, vomit or something on the street. The other is what they call a bodily envelope violation or mutilation. So uh, an open wound with maggots in it, anything like that. Uh, and it was there that this S2 was really active in liberals, so which is exactly what you expect, because that's where, you know, now you've got, you're not just looking at poo on the street, you're looking at a human being. Uh, and, and so I think this is kind of interesting, that the liberals, the emotions are, um, you know, to put it pejoratively, I suppose, running wild. Conservatives are saying, no, 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 we, we have to keep this in check. And I think, I think we see that in the way a lot of liberals and conservatives live their lives. Just a couple of slides on genetics because I think it's gotten us into a little bit of trouble. Uh, people tend to want to talk about this way too much, I think. You know, is it, uh, are we born with this or not? 
And what I want to leave you with is that you can have a lot of biological influences that don't come from genetics. There's a famous study I love where um, they uh, used taxi drivers in London, and they did brain imaging of them uh, as they drove the taxi for a long, long time. And it turned out their brains would change just a little bit. There's a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved with memory and directionality. And the hippocampus actually got a little bit bigger in certain parts the longer they drove a taxi in that very complicated city. And they controlled for age. They did it with bus drivers as well who are driving in the city, but they don't need to remember it because they're following the same route. And their hippocampus didn't change. So that, that's really fascinating. So that's very biological is my point, but it's not genetic because that, it changed throughout the course of a lifetime. So don't, don't equate those two words. Nonetheless, uh, I think some people get so fearful of genetics, a lot of our political science colleagues do, that we're not supposed to even talk about it. But it is the case that um, twin studies show that political views are heritable. It means, uh, you know, we got two different types of twins. Fraternal twins, or a bit more accurately called dizygotic twins, we have down here. Uh, monozygotic twins are identical twins up here that are basically 100% the same genetically as opposed to 50% the same. If you compare their political beliefs, how similar they are, um, again, I don't want to get too bogged down in the numbers, but you see the heritability coefficient there. Uh, monozygotic twins are much more similar politically than dizygotic twins. Now, there could be other reasons for this, but this is at least suggestive. This is a very common technique um, for uh, breast cancer. That was the BRCA. Uh, gene that people are all talking about. That started really because they found out that breast cancer did tend to run in families, that uh, MZ twins were either, both like, either likely to both have or both not have breast cancer. So it's kind of a neat, interesting, and uh, useful first step in the genetic process is to see if there's heritability at all. When we did this with politics, we asked them about 28 political views. We found that MZ twins much more similar than DZ twins. A lot of environment going on here too. This isn't 1.0. These three numbers will add up to one. These are environmental components, and this is the more genetic or heritability. So uh, all we were saying when we published this article was that you know, genetics play at least some role. It's not like they determine anything or that the environment isn't important, but genes are a factor. Um, so that's, that's kind of a battle we're still fighting because a lot of political scientists just don't want to believe that it's any, any factor at all in this. There have been some efforts to actually go into molecular genetics and find out which particular gene might be relevant. But of course, the thing is that there's going to be a whole bunch of genes that are relevant. Um, and we now know that you know, genetics is extremely complicated. We're not just talking about the genetic sequence, but there's epigenetics, things that we could, could spend a lot of time talking about. But there is one study uh, of, a, oh, that was wrong, of an allele, uh, a gene called DRD4, dopamine receptor, uh, which is a key part of the brain, um, the dopamine reward system. There's variation in it. This is called a polymorphism. Some people have four repeats of this particular sequence. A few of us have seven repeats. Seven repeats tend to be individuals who are more risk prone. They'll take some risks, they'll take some chances. They might be more likely to have ADHD. So these scholars said maybe they're liberals because we've seen liberals are a little bit more likely to try new things. It didn't work out so well, um, uh, but they did when they uh, combined it with how many friends you had as a kid, they did find a hint of a relationship. Uh, I just I want to make sure you're cautious about this because this is a, sometimes you can test a lot of these interactions and if you find one that works you get all excited but you don't know. If you, know, if you try 20 of these things, one of them is going to be statistically significant so you have to be careful about this. The other thing here is there are only a few people in the population that have two of these or, or diploid organisms. So you inherited one allele from mom, one from dad and uh, so 19% of us have one. Uh, you can imagine how many have two. You have to cross that, and you're talking about maybe three, four percent of the population. So just a few people in this case, but it does look like there might be a little bit of a relationship. If you have two R7 alleles and you have a lot of friends, then you might be likely to be more liberal. This is the kind of direction it's going. Our lab doesn't do a lot of these candidate gene association studies now just because I think the genetic story is way too complicated. I think we have to figure out some of the intermediate steps, the so-called uh, in-betweenotypes. Uh, to figure out what, what links politics and, uh, and genetics. And I think we'll, we'll stick with that and they can analyze the genetics. But I do think it's silly to claim that genetics is not part of the story. Here's, I'm starting to wrap up now, so uh, don't, don't uh, lose faith. This is kind of my view of what's going on here. I'd like to talk a lot about predispositions. I think each of us has a, a predisposition. Where does this come from? Well, partly genetics, so there I've said it. I think that is part of the story. Certainly not all the story. Early development is crucial, sometimes prenatal development. I mentioned monozygotic twins. One of the interesting things is that usually they'll come in the same chorion, that's the outer birth sac. So they're in the womb in the same chorion, they're identical twins. 
but about a third of them come from separate chorions. So they're, they're identical twins genetically, but they're in different chorions during the nine months of pregnancy. And it turns out there haven't been many studies done on politics, but for lots of other things, those identical twins that are in different chorions are much more different from each other than identical twins that are in the same chorion. And I just think that's stunning, you know, because that, they're in the same womb at the same time, yet that, that subtle difference uh, leads to uh, important differences as adults. So uh, that's the kind of thing I mean by early development. That's clearly important. Some of the early events we experience, certainly, you know, what, what you, happen, what you uh, talk about with your parents, if you did see 9-11, you know, that could affect your political beliefs. So that leaves us with these predispositions. A lot of people say, is it nature or nurture? Uh, is it the environment or is it genetics? I, uh, you know, what organisms do is respond to the environment. So everything is, uh, is the environment. So we have these life events, and we need to figure out what to do about them. You know, what does this mean? How do I handle this? How do I react to this situation? My view is that we all have these predispositions that serve as prisms, not prisms, prisms, like bending light, and that's what happens here. We take these life events, and they're altered. So Joseph and I maybe uh, you know, experience the same later life event, but our, our predispositions are different, and they lead to really important differences in how we respond, the political views that we have, what actions that we take. So that's why these, these things are bent. I mean, these predispositions can change. That's why I call them inertial, but changeable. I think they're kind of like super tankers. And if, if you experience politics, I think you have to agree that a lot of people don't change their views. I mean, you all might be, because you're still at a stage where you know, some things are in flux for you. But once people get to be 25, 30 years old, occasionally we see somebody who does a political 180, but that's fairly rare. So, and I think this is part of the reason. And I think political scientists have spent way too much time focusing on a connection between these life events and a political uh, action. Uh, we need to do that. These events are important. But we need to understand why people mold them the way they do. What, it is about, what is it about these predispositions? These things we've been talking about tonight, the physiological, cognitive, neurological, and, and broad psychological patterns. So that's kind of my shift. I, I want to focus more on, on individual variation because I think we tend to, tend to gloss over that. So how are we doing here? Um, right, the, how do these things fit together? I gave you a lot of examples of um, studies that have shown differences between liberals and conservatives. Do they, do they add up to anything? Here's what I think is maybe the important summary of, of all those things. On average, and presumably for evolutionarily sensible reasons, people are more attuned to negative than to positive stimuli. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it, that if something bad's in the environment, we need to pay attention to it. In fact, you could say there's a name for organisms that aren't attentive to negative things in the environment, and that name is dead. I mean, you're, at, at one level, that, that's what we need to worry about. So that, that pattern is quite well documented. There is a greater negativity, there is a negativity bias for human beings. But the degree of negativity bias varies markedly from person to person. Uh, our view is that this individual level variation in neg negativity bias correlates with political preferences, as you've seen. Uh, negativity bias is greater for conservatives. So now, uh, again, is, is that necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, Joseph mentioned the Daily Show. Uh, I think it was just last week, maybe the week before, John Stewart said something about conservatives wearing fear goggles. And he didn't mean that in a favorable way. But we've also heard it said that conservatives believe liberals wear rose-colored glasses. And one of the you know, conservatives love to say about liberals, they just don't get it. And I think that's absolutely right. And if getting it means really appreciating that it's a dangerous world. There are some bad guys out there, and we really need to do something about it. Liberals just seem oblivious to that. That is exactly the way it seems to conservatives. On the other hand, liberals look at conservatives and they say, these guys are finding you know, boogeymen everywhere. They're, they're creating them when they don't exist. And to a certain extent, that's true, because there's just these very different orientations toward uh, life and toward stimuli. And again, I'm trying to go out, out of my way here to not alienate anybody, because I don't know what your politics are, and I don't really care. But I think there are, <laughs> it's not my business. Uh, being attentive and responsive to obvious dangers is a good thing. You know, that, that's something we need. At the same time, that can go too far, can't it? And if you're just focused on that, if, if everybody's dangerous, then you're probably going to miss some opportunities to engage in things like trade um, or to be exposed to new ideas that the people on that uh, who might seem to you to be dangerous could, uh, could offer to us. So somehow we need to achieve a balance. There is one school of thought that says that's why uh, we have liberals and conservatives, that, that it actually is a benefit to have that combination in a society, so you don't go too far one way or the other. So um, my big message here is that our political opponents are not just stupid liars, 
So you know, here's a good example of a book from the right and Coulter. Uh, if Democrats had any brains, they'd be Republicans. Uh, and the left can you know, give as good as it gets. Al Franken says, uh, one of his books was called Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them. It was clearly uh, directed at the right. Of course, another of his books is called Rush Limbaugh is a Big Fat Idiot. So you know, these, are, these are kind of the views that each side has of each other. And you know, I think that's really unfortunate. I mean, uh, because I think we just need to recognize that those other people are different. They are experiencing a world that's very different than the one we experience. It just seems that way to them. They focus on different things. They respond physiologically to different things. We've, uh, this is a shameless plug. Uh, this is a book that we just published, and this is where we make the argument that, um, that these experiential differences are what matters, and that means we shouldn't really call each other names. That doesn't make much sense. Um, but it does make sense if you're trying to sell books. Not that I'm bitter, but you know, so Ann Coulter and Al Franken sell all kinds of books, and we just sell a few. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't think our, our point isn't a good one. It's, it's easy to say horrible things about the, the ideology that disagrees with you, uh, but I do think it would be a better place if we would, uh, if we would recognize that they're just uh, biologically different. It doesn't mean they'll always be that way. We can change them, but it's not going to be easy to change. I think if we recognize the message I just have been harping on, that we could have a, a slightly more tolerant polity. Uh, documenting differing physiological and psychological predisposition might increase tolerance. This is what's happened with regard to sexual orientation. People who believe sexual orientation is biological are more tolerant of uh, those people with, uh, with other sexual orientations. Left-handedness. You know, this used to be something that was part of the devil, uh, an evil spirit, uh, and, you know, they would hit people. My father was left-handed, and in school he would be hit with a ruler until he was had, his hand was bleeding because he wasn't supposed to write that way. Now we recognize it's really, this is biological. Uh, uh, mental illness. Um, uh, here's a, a young fellow with Down syndrome. You know, and, and it used to be viewed that this was all the result of improper parenting, uh, or that the child was somehow lazy or something. You know, that, so tolerance has increased greatly when we recognize that these things really are biological, and not just somebody being, you know, in the case of politics, uh, willfully obtuse or reading the wrong kinds of things. So uh, this is my last slide. I think. Uh, I, I hope it goes without saying that we could use a little bit more tolerance in the political arena. This doesn't mean you don't have strong beliefs and you can't think those people are wrong, but you have to understand they're wrong because from a biological cognitive point of view, they are different than we are. Thanks.